You know. Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful day here at the Discovery Center here in the heart of Fairmount Park in North Philadelphia. What a beautiful location to talk about this very topic. The Discovery Center was once an abandoned water reservoir closed off from the community for years. The Audubon Society, Outward Bound, and the neighboring Strawberry Mansion neighborhood got together to repurpose and reopen this environmental asset and to ensure that it was open for all. It is now a mecca for urban nature explorers, community meetings, and celebrations alike. I'd like to thank Meg Wise, Robin, John Frisbee, and the entire staff and team here for accommodating us today. My name is Representative Donna Bullock. I am the chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, and I'm honored to be standing with all of the community leaders, residents of Strawberry Mansion, advocates, Jerome Shabazz, and the members of the State Environmental Justice Advisory Board, Ebony Griffin, and the members of the City's Environmental Justice Advisory Commission, the staff of Clean Water Action, and the many other advocacy groups, community groups, and activists who are representing with us today. I'd like to thank Governor Wolf and Secretary Patrick O'Donnell for being with us and for your commitment to this issue of environmental justice and for joining the members of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus for this announcement. And to all of our staff for organizing this press event, and of course, to all of my colleagues who are here with me, Senator Hughes and Representative Brown, thank you for hosting us in your legislative districts. To my co-sponsors on the bills, Representative Rabb and Representative Kenyatta, and then I'm gonna to try to make sure I get everyone else here, Senator Street and Senator Capaletti, Representative Krajewski, Representative Gentz, and Gentz, yes, and I think I have all of the legislators who have joined us today in this announcement. Zip codes, zip codes. We can look at any map and determine the quality of one's education, whether or not they will be denied a mortgage, how hot it is on their exact city block. We can predict their health and we can pinpoint their exposure to pollution. Many of these zip codes are often black and brown. Many of them are low income. But many of these zip codes are also home to people who have been fighting for cleaner air, cleaner water, and healthier communities. And every Pennsylvanian deserves that. This week, members of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus introduced a resolution to mark the 30th anniversary of the historic National People of Color Environmental Justice Summit. At that summit, the folks there adopted the 17 principles of environmental justice. This language became the framework for environmental justice work in the decades that followed. One of those principles provides that environmental justice demands that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all, free of discrimination or bias. Another demands the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision making, including needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. In essence, these principles memorialize the need for a seat at the table. The legislation we are announcing today seeks to do that. This legislative package has not only been informed by the 17 principles, but it has been informed by the work of people like Celine Mayfield in Chester, Jerome Shabazz in Philadelphia, and young people like Vic Barrett in Allegheny County, and the many other Pennsylvanians that fight every single day for the right to live, work, and play without the constant threat of toxic pollutants. Our legislation, along with the governor's executive order, seeks to strengthen the voices of Pennsylvanians across the Commonwealth, especially those living in these vulnerable communities. The members of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus have or will be introducing four pieces of legislation. One, to codify and strengthen the Office of Environmental Justice. Two, to codify and empower the Environmental Justice Advisory Board. Three, to establish the Independent Environmental Justice Policy Center and four, to establish a process for DEP, our Department of Environmental Protection, when reviewing permit applications for certain facilities 
in environmental justice communities, a process that will require the facilities to submit and submit an environmental justice impact statement and a process that will require DEP to consider the cumulative environmental impacts on those communities when reviewing applications. So today, we commemorate this 30th anniversary of the environmental justice principles with a momentous occasion, the announcement of legislation and an executive order that empowers the residents of the zip codes across Pennsylvania, of every zip code across Pennsylvania. Legislation that can be truly transformational when it comes to correcting years of bad environmental policy. But sometimes, to move legislation forward, you need a little spark from the governor's office. And that's why I am so honored to have a partner in the governor's office with a whole lot of spark. Someone who understands the power of the people, someone who understands the, that that power cannot be silenced, and that we all benefit from including them at the table. That partner is our very own Governor Wolf. Governor Wolf. So I'm, I'm, thank you very much, uh, Representative Bullock, Madam Chairman. I, I am uh, pleased to be here. And we were, we were talking, you gave me a, a nice tour of the place. I went to the top of the tower back here. Um, I, I went up the stairway, though. I'm an old man. I, I, I didn't climb up the, uh, the, the net. But, but what a beautiful, <laughs> what a beautiful view. And, and all of you from Philadelphia, this, this is an amazing reflection of what an amazing set of resources we all have here in Pennsylvania, here in Philadelphia. And here's Senator Williams. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to call you out here. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. Well, well. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, this is really, really important. I'm going to, I am proud to have signed an executive order to do all the things that we talked about, that, that Representative Bullock talked about. But we need the legislation to make sure this executive order lasts beyond my term. Uh, and it's in, enshrined in, in legislation. Uh, so that's not just something that the governor can do or decide maybe she or he doesn't want to do, but that, that it's, it's here. And that we always recognize the importance of environmental justice in any decision we make that has any uh, impact on, on the environment. So um, I, I'm, I'm glad to have this, this chance to talk about this. I want to specifically thank the Environmental Justice Advisory Board, and I think Representative Bullock already mentioned them, and the Environmental Justice advocates and stakeholders, I think all of the important ones who are here today who have worked tirelessly to address the issue of environmental injustice and to confront the issue of environmental racism. The Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania contains a promise. It's clear. Pennsylvanians that our environment is for each and every one of us, for all of us. The Environmental Rights Amendment declares that the people of the Commonwealth have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. What that means is that all Pennsylvanians, all Pennsylvanians should be able to live in and enjoy a clean and healthy environment. Again, that is all Pennsylvanians, all of us. It's a right guarantee to all of us under our Constitution, and it includes outdoor spaces, clean energy resources, public lands, and public natural resources. Unfortunately, Pennsylvania has not always lived up to the great promise and opportunity of our Constitution. Historically, low-income communities, communities of color, have borne a disproportionate share of harmful environmental damage, and those challenges continue today. For example, communities of color and low-income communities are disproportionately affected by pollution, by polluting industries. Members of these communities are more likely to live near higher polluting companies, industrial complexes, and service facilities than higher income white communities. They're more likely to be exposed to polluted air. They're more likely to suffer from the adverse health consequences that exposure to air pollution causes. We know, for example, that asthma rates are among the lowest, uh, are highest among the lowest income Pennsylvanians. Actually, they're twice that of residents uh, at the state, state average uh, for the, the residents of Pennsylvania. Right now, climate change is only exacerbating the economic harms that many vulnerable communities are experiencing as a result of environmental injustice. <clears throat> and the harms these communities have experienced have only been compounded by challenges accessing information 
and resources from the state government. So my administration is committed to working with environmental justice stakeholders to strengthen our efforts to ensure environmental justice for every Pennsylvania. Environmental justice is about the air we breathe, the water we drink, the neighborhoods we live in. It's about acknowledging a long history of policies that have caused lower income, vulnerable communities to unjustly bear the consequences of pollution, environmental harm, and climate change. It's about refusing to continue to force communities to choose between affordable housing, clean air, and good place to live for their children. We want the Commonwealth to support communities of color and low-income communities that have experienced environmental harms and environmental racism, and help to ensure that no community is disproportionately harmed by environmental damage. That's why today I'm signing an executive order, actually I signed it last night, an executive order to strengthen, I just want to be honest here. I signed executive order to strengthen Pennsylvania's efforts to pursue environmental justice in our communities. This executive order builds on the work already done at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and you'll hear from Patrick McDonald McDonnell in just a minute. But it does three key things. First, it strengthens the Department of Environmental Protection's infrastructure to do the work around environmental justice by formally establishing the Office of Enver Environmental Justice, OEJ, and the appointment of a Director of Environmental Justice that outlines a broad scope of work for that office. Second, it formalizes the Environmental Justice Advisory Board within the department. And third, it establishes an Environmental Justice Intra-Agency Council. This interagency council will use a multi-agency lens to provide comprehensive feedback on the Commonwealth's environmental justice challenges and opportunities. Again, this, this is stuff that we need to do in order to make sure that we're not doing things wrong. We need to ask ourselves, what impact is the thing that we're doing, what is that gonna have on specific communities? We haven't been asking that the way we should in the past. I'm gonna change that with this executive order and the legislation that I'm hoping we can get passed will change it uh, forever. We must work now to prevent further climate change. We need to mit mitigate environmental pollution and the unfair harm it causes to all of us, but especially to vulnerable communities. And we need to ensure that every Pennsylvanian can claim their constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. My executive order is an important next step toward true environmental justice in Pennsylvania, but let me be clear, it is only a first step. I want to thank all the legislators here today, especially Representative Bullock, Representative Kenyatta, Representative Robb, and Senator Hughes for stepping up to further our progress in this regard. Their proposed legislation would further cement our Commonwealth's commitment to environmental justice. So I want to thank the entire Legislative Black Caucus for your dedication, your partnership, and your advocacy on behalf of your communities, but on behalf of every single Pennsylvanian. And I urge the leadership in the General Assembly to bring these bills up for a quick vote, send them to my desk, I will sign them. It's what Pennsylvanians deserve and it's what we need. Thank you and now I'll turn it back to <laughs> Representative Boyd. You hear that? He said he will sign it. That's a commitment. It's on the record, Governor. Thank you very much, Governor Wolf. And we know that no leader uh, can do this work without a great team. And so I would like to now introduce in, uh, as a group, and they can follow each other, uh, the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection, Secretary Patrick McDonald, and the Executive Director of the Office of Environmental Justice, Ms. Allison Acevedo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick McDonald. I'm the Secretary of uh, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you uh, this morning to, to uh, further uh, the cause of environmental justice in the Commonwealth. Uh, unfortunately, as was mentioned, we have no shortage of examples across the Commonwealth of instances where residents and communities throughout Pennsylvania bear the disproportionate environmental burden of pollution from environmental racism exacerbated through policies and practices like redlining and gentrification. Air pollution, water pollution, heavy traffic, land pollution, illegal dumping, litter, climate change, and numerous other environmental harms have disproportionately impacted communities of color and low-income communities throughout Pennsylvania. 
Today's executive order by Governor Wolf does not fix all of that, but it is that first step in making sure that we have some of the tools to mitigate and prevent it from happening in the future. Under Governor Wolf, DEP has formally recognized and codified the Office of Environmental Justice, currently led by my colleague Allison Acevedo, who you'll hear from uh, in a moment, and I'll, I'll preview that by saying she is a rock star in the office uh, and, and has really, really driven all of this forward in ways uh, uh, that, that are remarkable. Uh, the order will also make sure that future governors cannot simply ignore environmental justice if they think it is politically inconvenient. This order is also an opportunity for DEP to, uh, to expand our work in, in addressing environmental injustice. We are already collecting more data on the impacts pollution has had on EJ communities. This is helping us to map out which communities would be affected by new facilities and enable us to better engage residents from the communities that would be most affected. These efforts will help us better allocate resources to ensure that communities are being heard and listened to as we consider grant awards, permit applications, and other authorizations. I want to also recognize the work of our Environmental Justice Advisory Board, which, which will also be codified uh, by this order. And those members have been vital uh, to the work that we do in the, in the department in advancing environmental justice. This order is not the finale of environmental justice work in Pennsylvania, but another chapter in that book. And there are still many chapters to write. Part of that next chapter is in the legislation proposed by Representative Bullock and, her, and others to ensure that cumulative impacts of pollution are taken into account during that permitting process. I look forward to continuing uh, forward and, and working with you and writing all of those next chapters and advancing the cause of environmental justice. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the Director of the Office of Environmental Justice, Allison Acevedo. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Governor Wolf, Secretary McDonald, our Environmental Justice Advisory Board members, <laughs> members of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, and especially environmental justice community advocates. Good morning. My name is Allison Acevedo, and I'm the Director of the Office of Environmental Justice at DEP. I'm so excited to be here with everyone recognizing the significance and impact of environmental injustice and the need to establish environmental justice infrastructure within the government and through legislative action. Before I move on, I really want to recognize and honor the struggles and tireless work, advocacy, and activism of people who live in frontline communities, who have had to live with decades, decades of environmental racism, unjust practices, and health challenges. We do our work to elevate your voice and to help improve and strengthen conditions in your communities. As Secretary McDonald said, we understand, we understand as government officials that Governor Wolf's executive order does not fix environmental justice challenges in Pennsylvania alone. We also understand that we need to take action in-house in government to build infrastructure at DEP and throughout the Commonwealth to support communities of color and low-income communities in addressing environmental racism, environmental injustice, climate change, and environmental health issues. The Office of Environmental Justice was birthed out of community action in Chester to combat environmental racism. The environmental Justice, the executive order here will help us to ensure that we have some of the tools needed within government to assist environmental justice communities. The executive order fortifies the work of the Office of Environmental Justice and the Environmental Justice Advisory Board and establishes a collaborative group of, co of agencies within the Commonwealth to strategize and build resources for environmental justice communities and ensure grants, programs, and internal policies embed environmental justice and equity principles. Over the past several years, the Office of Environmental Justice has heard from and engaged with communities through listening sessions and roundtables held throughout the Commonwealth. 
This executive order requires DEP to develop an environmental justice mapping tool, an EJ policy, or multiple EJ policies, an EJ strategic plan outlining our agency strategies to address environmental justice and embed environmental justice, in, in, environmental justice into our work in an intentional way that is accessible and meaningful to the communities that we've heard from and listened to. As we implement the work outlined in this executive order and we advance the new executive, advance the new environmental justice legislative priorities, particularly as we develop our EJ policy and begin to frame the environmental justice strategic plan, we will continue to actively outreach and listen to and engage with communities and our environmental justice advisory board so we can begin to allocate resources to communities in greatest need in EJ communities and achieve substantive, substantive change for so many residents that have suffered environmental injustice for far too long. Thank you, Secretary, and thank you, Allison, for those remarks. And we look forward to supporting your leadership in the department and in the Office of Environmental Justice. And as they mentioned, this work cannot be done without the support and the information that we receive from the stakeholders, stakeholders like Clean Water Action that is here, uh, Penn Environment who is here, Moms Clean Air Force who is here, and I'm a Mom Clean Air Force member, um, <laughs> and the residents of this community that we are standing in today in Strawberry Mansion, Strawberry Mansion CDC, and Strawberry Mansion NAC, and neighborhoods like that. Um, I want to thank them all for joining us today. And now I have the, yes, thank you, thank you, people. thank you. Now I have the honor of introducing my colleagues who have been co-sponsors or have introduced um, bills to support this legislative package, and I'll introduce them in order and then they can follow. Uh, Senator Hughes, Representative Kenyatta, and Representative Rabb, I thank you for your partnership and please join us at the mic. So isn't this a great moment? Yes. Come on, isn't this a great moment? Isn't it? Yes. Look, look, the Discovery Center, isn't this wonderful? Yes. Come on, give this place yes. a round of applause, please. Now, now, you're not going to get away that easy with just applause, all right? Because the Discovery Center works with a program called Outward Bound. Right? Give Outward Bound a, a, a shout. <laughs> Governor, I may, I may give you an out on this one. Outward Bound raises money by repelling down buildings. All right? All right? All right? And, so, and, and having been one who, who's done that four different times, the, the Outward Bound Discovery folks will not let you leave here unless you sign a commitment to do that next year. All right? Let's be real clear about that. All right? So, Chair Bullock, thank you very much for convening us. Thank you very much for making sure that we keep this uh, top on our legislative agenda to get done. Governor, thank you for signing the executive order last night. We appreciate that. Last night, okay? <laughs> you, that's how you roll. You are ahead of the game, all right? You know, we <laughs> just want to just for the record, okay? Um, and, and thank you to all my Senate and House colleagues and all of the activists, everyone who's been fighting in this fight for so many years. This is an important moment, not just because we're at the Discovery Center, uh, not because our chair has convened us, not because the governor, uh, just because, not just because the governor signed the executive order, but quite frankly, we are, we, we are in a very special moment right now as we speak. About 130 miles due south in Washington, D.C., uh, we are praying and working that our colleagues in Washington get their work done and get it done well. Uh, the reconciliation bill is being discussed as we speak, Governor. Yep. And in that reconciliation bill is about a half a trillion dollars dedicated towards the issues of climate and environment. And it's been structured in a way, all the information indicates that it's been structured in a way 
that the issue of environmental justice will be a wide and clear lens that those dollars must flow through. Boss, I'm looking at you now, okay? All right? You, okay? All right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, can show me the money, all right? Uh, and as you know, as a Democratic chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, I always think about the money, okay? Because the money, that kind of investment, with that kind of lens, can be transformational for decades to come. Why is it important? As we fight to, as we partner with our governor and fight for more resources out of the American Rescue Plan dollars that are already sitting, waiting to be spent, uh, we need to understand what we're fighting for, this issue of economic justice. What, what that some, for some people that may be, that may be a broad term. But let's understand this. In far too many zip codes across Pennsylvania, in urban, rural, and suburban communities, in communities, quite frankly, of all kinds of colors, but obviously communities that are black and brown, a child, a newborn, will come home from the hospital to a house that's probably filled with lead paint. When it's time, that, that infant will probably wind up in a child care facility that is a home-based child care facility, probably also filled with lead paint. That child will advance out of that child care facility and go on to school. And if you look at the aging infrastructure of our school infrastructure, well documented that far too many of our schools, far too many of our schools are filled with lead asbestos and toxins where in fact that child is working against the odds for success. That's environmental justice. When we make those investments in those spaces, clean water, air to breathe, communities to live in, when we make the investments in those spaces, then we are winning the fight on environmental justice. Fortunately, we've had a governor who's been able to be a great partner with us. And every time when we thought that we needed a little bit more, he dug around in the, in the state's piggy bank and found some dollars. We've had several announcements about new resources in that space. So we've got to fight for this to make this happen. We've got to build, we've got to make the legislation happen so that, that the signing of the executive order is institutionalized for decades to come. And we've got to join with our friends in Washington to make sure that a half a trillion dollars finds its way to success and those dollars wind up so the boss has some money to spend okay <laughs> so the advisory could yeah that's applaud that all right so so the so the that the advisory committee madam chair so that the advisory committee is not just advising on this legislation or that legislation that they're sinking their teeth on real investments transformational investments in all of those places that for far too long have been left out and locked out. So I thank you. I'll show you how to put the harness on for the repelling, okay? <laughs> Easy to be done. Don't be afraid. Just don't look down, okay? All right? Just don't look down, all right? That's where you lose it right there. I guarantee you, okay? I guarantee you. Huh? Okay. All right. We're going to start at the slide at the playground. Okay. All right. Okay. But thank you all very much. This is a great day. Spread the word. A great day. Good morning. Good morning. I want to just first start by saying thank you to every advocate, activist, agitator, because it is because of your work that we're standing here right now. As Rep. Bullock said in her opening, today is the 30th anniversary, 30 years, 30 years of people talking about the very issues that our governor and my colleagues that we are trying to address. 30 years folks have been talking about the lead, asbestos, and mold issue. For 30 years, folks have been talking about the disproportionate impacts of when you look at asthma and bronchitis and other issues that are related to communities where we have not addressed, where we have not addressed 
in a sufficient way the challenges that those communities are facing. And so if you're thinking about why does it matter for me to come to yet another meeting, organize with my neighbors, make phone calls, go to folks' offices in Harrisburg and their district offices, why does it matter for you to keep being involved in the organizations that are represented here today? Because the work that you do as advocates and activists in your community, the work that you do demanding that you live in an area where your kid doesn't have to struggle to breathe because they're having an asthma attack, where you don't have to continue to see disproportionate rates of cancer and other diseases. This is why that work matters. This is why that work matters. And so for some of the folks who were there 30, 25, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, to the young people who are showing up again and again and again, demanding that government acknowledge and then act on this problem, this is why it matters. Moments like today, where you have a governor who is ready, willing, and able to use the authority he has to ensure that, things, that these things happen on his watch. But the legislation that I'm introducing, Rep. Rab, Senator Hughes, Rep. Bullock, we have to make sure that we don't care who has the watch, but that our government is functioning in a way that we prioritize this issue. Every administration, we prioritize this issue. The facts are clear. Climate change is real, not a Chinese hoax. The impacts are not felt equally. And the work that we have to do is work that we've needed to do for a long time. But for the folks who've been doing this, I hope you feel good, because you really have some reinforcements. If you look all around this city and all around this Commonwealth, people understand that we have to act on this issue. And our legislation just does just that. It begins the movement of us acting on this issue. And Senator Hughes is, is, is right, and I hope they're, 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 they're listening. And Senator Hughes, if you were down there, we might be moving quicker. We need to get this, this money from the Build Back Better agenda into the communities that, that need it most. And the frameworks and legislation that we are outlining here today creates a real internal whole of government effort that when those dollars do come, you don't want nobody better than Allison Acevedo helping to move this work, this work forward. And I'll just end with this. Allison is moved, but Allison is from the 181st district. Okay, and so no matter where she goes, Allison is from the 181st district. And so I'm gonna say 181st district, this is what we do. Well, I'm gonna claim her too. And I'm gonna tell you why, because the bill that we'll be introducing that will create the Pennsylvania Environmental Justice Policy Center um, was inspired in part by conversations with Director Acevedo. And this is a special moment for me because this is the first time we've actually met. I thought you were a leprechaun or something, but the pandemic has a way of keeping people apart, but also bringing people together when it matters most. And so this is a special moment because I get to be surrounded by people who have been doing the work for years and frankly, for generations. So in many respects, those of us who are legislators are good followers. We're good followers. We are honoring the 30th anniversary of the 17 principles around environmental justice by doing our job to legislate. And the governor has put forth an executive order to do what he can in the executive branch. That's all very important. We need an environmental justice policy center that transcends the whims of the, legislature, of the legislature and whomever is in the governor's office, to be independent and autonomous, to talk about environmental justice, not just rhetorically, but to process all of the recommendations for environmental justice from all the stakeholders who've been doing the work for years. That's really important. It needs to be permanent and substantive and well-funded. Senator Hughes, you know about that. Well-funded. So this is a really special moment 
And not just because it's the 30th anniversary, but also 50 years ago, we became one of the few states, actually only two now, that has a green amendment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania codified environmental stewardship into its state constitution. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean if we don't have the tools to honor that foresight 50 years ago, which was, I believe, unanimously passed, which means both parties. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> but then there's something else, too. 54 years ago, my grandma helped make sure an incinerator wasn't put in her poor black community. When next door, in an all-white community, they're putting a pool, a public pool that was not available to all members of the public. So you see, I wouldn't actually be here if it weren't for the leadership of people who were fighting for environmental justice before there was even the term. And for all those people who don't understand that you can't talk about the environment or climate action or whatever term you want without talking about racial justice, you can't do it. And 116 years ago, there was a man who stood under the rotunda in Harrisburg, President Teddy Roosevelt, who was known to be a conservationist and a trust buster. He broke up big corporations and such. And he was lauded for that visionary leadership. But I stood on that plaque just the other day, literally, when I was in Harrisburg, and it was put down in October of 1906. And just a few feet away, there was a tile of a Native American scalping a white man. It's in the tile of the floor under the rotunda. No one talks about the fact that even someone who believed in conservation had no respect for indigenous people. None. We can't talk about the environment without talking about the people all people who are impacted by what we do to the environment. All people. We are on sacred land. This is the Lene and Lenape people. This is their tribal land. And it should be honored every time we speak. And they didn't have to have these conversations because they worked in tandem with Mother Nature. They weren't creating technologies and ways to get around it, they worked together as many indigenous communities around the globe did. And we need to listen to their wisdom because it endures. And I'm hoping that the work we do collaboratively will honor those traditions because without it, Mother Nature doesn't need us. There are other species that will survive and I'd like to think that we can last at least as long as the cockroaches. <laughs> so let's get this done, but we can only do it together. Thank you. I don't know, Rep. Brad, those cockroaches do not die. <laughs> but we can also always count on you for the history lesson, and so thank you. And since we were in the business of claiming Allison, I want to say I can claim her first. <laughs> because when I was in law school, she worked there and we followed each other when she was doing child care policy. I was the child care lawyer. And now here we are in this space together. So I've known Allison for quite some time. Our kids went to birthday parties together. I claim her first. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to my colleagues for uh, those remarks and for sharing the work that we are doing together and understanding that it requires that partnership. But our work, as I said earlier, was informed by the people on the ground the people who have been doing this work, the people who are a part of the advisory commissions, the advisory boards, the people who are in their communities fighting against these toxic pollutant facilities, um, the people who have helped train and educate younger generations of environmentalists. Um, and so I am honored to not just introduce um, friends and colleagues in this space, but advocates, um, and for me, so I would call them the, the sort of you know, fathers, I'm not going to say grandfathers, but the fathers of some of the Philadelphia environmental justice, I know, I see you say, watch it. <laughs> right, sorry. 
Uh, but they have been mentors to me. And so um, I'm honored to introduce the, uh, one of the co-founders of the Chester Environmental Partnership, Dr. Horace Strand, as well as my good friend, um, and who I understand was at that summit 30 years ago, uh, the current chair and president of the um, Clean Water Action, Mr. Maurice Sampson. Uh, please join us, Dr. Strand, and followed by Mr. Sampson. Take this mask off. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to be here to share on this historic day, a great day for all Pennsylvanians and all communities that have suffered because of the injustices that have been opposed upon them because of environmental injustice. And when I started, it was called environmental racism. I come from the city of Chester, which is the state of Pennsylvania's first city, oldest city and the place where the first Continental Congress met, the courthouse still there. And also, I don't get, there's too many Philadelphians here, but I want you to know, <laughs> is the place where Wilm Penn landed. <laughs> that place over there is not the real Wilm Penn landing. <laughs> it's in Chester. That's a different press conference. <laughs> but nevertheless, 30 years ago, my community was invaded by solid waste, it was invaded by infectious medical waste, a company called Thermopure that was given a permit to burn an autoclave 5.5 times the tonnage of infectious medical waste generated in the entire state of Pennsylvania, a rock crushing company called Avenesia, and a permit was getting ready to permit for soil remediation to come into that same area and burn uh, toxic soil and contaminated soil by diesel and gas and all the kind of things are in the soil. 90 feet from where residents live, we had the clustering effect of clustering effects. The DEP at that time was issuing permits rapidly in our community like nowhere else in the state of Pennsylvania. As a grassroots organization, unfamiliar with our laws and our privileges and our rights as human beings, we organized to fight the clustering of these environment-unfriendly facilities. And with the success of many, many advocates and many, many hard workers, the Public Venture Law Center under the work of Jerry Balter, we fought this issue all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It became mute when the company went bankrupt that we were a man using as a lead company. I'm saying amen because I'm a preacher, and when I heard uh, Senator Hughes talk about uh, money for, I thought he was going to raise a plate. I was going to join in. <laughs> but nevertheless, although we have stopped the clustering of unfriendly facilities in Chester because of the elected officials that are also advocates of environmental justice, we still are left with the effects of the damage of these unfriendly facilities in our community. And I am excited about uh, the Black Legislative Caucus uh, legislation proposal under the leadership of Chairman Bullock, and also the legislative initiative and the executive order by Governor Wolf, because each of them together will address not only uh, the issue of EJ and environmental justice in Pennsylvania, but also will deal with the effects of the polluters, the effect of the conditions, the effect of the asthma problem, the effect of the lead problem, the effect of those who have been suffering for years because their community has been abandoned. We need money in our community. We need economic empowerment to solve these problems and to meet the needs of our children who are suffering on a daily basis. I'm thankful for this opportunity. I'm thankful that you guys are getting it right. Everything that I've heard proposed here is what EJ nationally has been asking for and fighting for around the country. I've had the privilege, and I'm almost finished, of being a member of NEJAC, serving as an advisor to the Secretary of EPA for three terms. I'm president. I also sit on the Environmental Justice Board of Pennsylvania, working with Secretary Bedano and also Allison, who we call uh, the Little Caesar, not the Little Mimp. <laughs> Very powerful young lady, and we're honored to work with her. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for giving us 
uh, the opportunity to see the light before God calls us home. For 30 years, we've been working at this. And for 30 years, we've been hoping for the kind of legislation and initiatives that you are putting forth. There's one cuss word in environmental justice. Many of you may not know that. I'm a preacher. It's called cumulative effect. That's the one word that polluters and other folks that mean you no good don't want to hear. Because when you look at the cumulative effect of all these environmental unfinished facilities uh, propagated and progated and put into one community, you will see that they are damaging the health and welfare of our community. The city of Chester has been considered as a, uh, 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 a city that is uh, ranked in comparison to undeveloped nations as far as health is concerned. High, low rate uh, issues of babies, infant mortalities, cancer, uh, senior citizens who have amputation of feet, uh, kidney disorders, blood pressures, high blood pressure as far as uh, 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 asthma and, and, and uh, uh, the, the effects of all these chemicals being breathed on a daily basis in our air. We need resources to combat these things. And with your help and with this effort, not just Chester, but all communities who are facing similar conditions will get the help we need in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania will lead this nation along with other states who have put forth an effort to do what is needed to make a difference. Lastly, I want to say this. I've dealt with many, many uh, regulatory agencies in many different states, and all of them are filled with human beings who understand and know what's going on. And the one thing they have said to me around the country, we know what needs to be done. We know what's right, but we don't have the tools or the power to do it. Yes. Today, in Pennsylvania, we have the power. The DP has the power to do what it knows to do, and nobody can stop them from doing it. Thank you. Um, Ian, would you bring the crew and put them right here on either side of this podium, please? <laughs> Both sides. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Governor Wolf, Representative Bullock, and distinguished elected officials. My name is Marie Sampson, and I am the Eastern Pennsylvania Director for Clean Water Action. I'm going to start by saying that if this doesn't pass in six weeks, this doesn't pass in six years, this doesn't pass in 10 years, our commitment is that we're going to be there, Clean Water Action, to do what is necessary on the street to get this done. That is our commitment. 30 years ago this week, I had the privilege to be the sole Pennsylvania delegate to the first National People of Color Environmental Summit. I have begun my career as a teenager 20 years before that in the first Earth Day. It was an auspicious event, and for the first time, I attended a gathering where I was not the only person of color in the room. Rather, I was one of more than 1,000 black, brown, red, and yellow delegates from all 50 states, Puerto Rico, Chile, Mexico, and as far away as Nigeria and the Marshall Islands. After 20 years of criticism for my involvement, and it was then called the, the White People's Movement, that event validated my commitment to the work for the environment. On the third day of that event, I was recruited to serve on the review committee for the draft principles of environmental justice. My sole comment, this document needs a preamble. In that moment, we could not have imagined the historical significance of what we had done. Looking back from 30 years from now, today may be such a day. The term environmental justice evolved from a 1988 study of demographics and the siting of landfills and hazardous waste facilities. The study found the incidence of siting such facilities in African-American communities, regardless of income, was so prevalent it could be considered a criteria for locating such facilities. The same study was repeated in 2007, and the conditions were worse. 
The Reverend Bridge and Savis Jr., then of the United Church of Christ, coined the term environmental justice to describe the institutional racism demonstrated in the siting of those facilities. That said, no one should consider the legislation discussed today as limited to black and brown people. Environmental law is written to a standard that is based on cost and profitability. Environmental justice legislation reasons those standards should also consider the health of the surrounding community. This is a standard that should not only apply to the black and brown residents in the cities of Chester, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, and the Philadelphia neighborhoods in Nicetown, Strawberry Mansions, and Eastwick. It should also apply decided to the decidedly white communities impacted by long wall mining in Green and Washington counties, the coal mining and fracking fields in Northeast Pennsylvania, and the more than 200 communities violated by the Mariner East Pipeline. Environmental justice is about health and equity and the full recognition of Article I, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, guaranteeing that all Pennsylvania residents have the right to pure air, the preservation of uh, pure air, clean water, natural, scenic, and historic and ethical values of the environment. Thank you. Okay, guys. Thank you, Dr. Strand. I forgot you was a reverend and you were going to take us there. And thank you, Mr. Sampson, for sharing your perspective as one of, as our delegate from Pennsylvania to that summit 30 years ago. This concludes our remarks and programs for today. We now open for questions and answers from the press media. Thank you. Have a great day. They are speechless.